Hello, everybody, and welcome to a momentous occasion, episode 50 over onto the hills. Nobody thought, nobody thought we'd make it this far, Harry. We never thought we'd make it this far. Ah! Happy 50th anniversary, my darling. Yeah. You know what? I, when I, when I when we said it was 50th show, I thought, my goodness me, I think it, it felt like it's been going longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember our first chat. Yeah. And I thought, who's this weirdo? I can't understand what he's saying. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I can't win. If I'm up north, people think I'm talk like a southerner. If I'm down south, I can't, people can't understand me, so I, I'm not. I don't well, fit. I think as well because you've just come back from your holidays. Now you've got a slight Scottish twang as well. It's <laughs> gone real deep. Anyway, it's been a joy. Fifty episodes. It's flown by. That's... What a joy you are in my life. I am so blessed. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Uh, tell me what you've been doing. Holidays. Well... Yeah, we went to Scotland for three nights. And I have to say, the Scottish, they do, they really, they're fantastic. The hospitality, the oh, Scottish people. Oh, aren't they just? Aren't they just? Yeah, you get lots of chippy English when we've been away over the, <laughs> over the years. <laughs> people working in uh, restaurants and cafes and they can barely be bothered to talk to you. But where everybody in Scotland literally couldn't do enough. It was a wonderful time. We didn't want to come home. I could have... Yeah, it's not long for your holidays. No, it's not. Well, we, what we're doing is like lots of little things. So we had a few days in the lakes, a few days, um, because we're just so scared to book anything or big. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that seems to have passed uh, now. But literally, over, something, something significant happened in Scotland to do with COVID because one night it was all one way systems. <clears throat> in the, oh, yeah. In the and then they lifted everything, didn't they? They went the next, free for all. Yeah, the next day it was like, oh, well, whatever. You had to wear your face mask still. <laughs> Did um, you go down for breakfast and there was like, there's no arrows? Yeah, literally, free, that was free it. We ran to the cereal aisle. <laughs> That's dangerous for me. When it was table service, my portion control was sensible. And as soon as I was <laughs> at the buffet, <laughs> they were like, we're going to have to order extra wheat a bit. So I don't know what happened this yeah, morning. Happened? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, great you know you probably similar to me holidays i never seem to feel relaxed after a little break we did so much walking we went to the zoo um and i thought oh we walked back from the zoo and that's quite a big walk from edinburgh zoo back then <laughs> it's, it's not the nicest of walks either it's just out a kind of busy road but um yeah you gotta do it. my goodness me we ate some i packed some food away so we had to do those miles went up arthur's seat that's a oh, first thing did you run up it or walk up it we walked up it one day in torrential rain um with the kids oh, which wasn't course, great scotland <laughs> couldn't see anything when we got to the top i don't know if people realize this but it is not a nice little tarmac path all the way up there's a bit of a scramble in places but then i went up myself the next day with my gopro so coming soon to a youtube <laughs> channel <laughs> But, uh, and then what else? We got back to some, oh yes, the, our local TV transmitter. So Northeast viewers and listeners will know all about this. Their Saturday night takeaway, whatever it is they watch on an evening isn't, <clears throat> isn't currently working because the transmitter got struck by lightning. Um, and I think... So the we, whole of Northeast? Well, I, I, yeah, I, it's Yorkshire Bay. So North Yorkshire, Hartlepool, Cleveland... And then they said some areas of County Durham and we can't get TV. You can get watched Amazon, watch something on Amazon last night. So that was working. Um, but yeah, st- th- thousands and thousands of people without terrestrial um, television. So that'll be quite stressful for some households. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been a bit of a day. Do you only get back? It's like, all right, now you've got to kind of start doing things again. Do you find it quite easy to go to switch holiday mode back to work mode? No. I'm very good at going to holiday mode, but yeah, then yeah. the return, the drawing it in again, I'm like, oh, I don't want to. Well, with a lot of my work these days, especially with the, with the podcast and the YouTube channel, it's not kind of formal work where you used to go mm. somewhere. <clears throat> so I struggle with the, the lines of what yeah. what work what type of work is and when i should be doing a certain type of work like when i'm in the workshop doing the day job sometimes i'm kind of messaging people on youtube and stuff like that so yeah my lines are pretty blurred so i'm not really i don't cope well with that i don't like change i don't like change <laughs> no no but what about you yeah you're well, well i've got two big questions about your holiday first yeah you're Before not gonna I talk, me yeah. no. okay first one what was your favorite animal in the zoo Oh, no, they straight away. Otters. Oh, I 
love an otter. They were fantastic. You know, you go, we tried to see the pandas, the tigers, the lions, and we didn't see any pandas. Um, the lions were great. But the otters were just like, bang, they were playing with each other. They were jo- oh, the penguins were fantastic too. So proper I don't wanna... show. They put on a yeah. proper show. Yeah, they were great. <laughs> uh, and the second question, what was your favourite holiday snack? Snack, well, we did <clears throat> because we're all trying to be veggies. Um, oh, snack, I'm not too sure, but my favorite meal we all end up in Wagamama's, which is <gasps> you know, like oh, a, classic, I love and that. you know, if you are a vegan and a, you kind of go to these chain restaurants, can't go wrong with Wagamama's. It was, <laughs> was it just well, it's just vegetables, isn't it? Sort yeah. of fried in a wok. But they do so, all these um, now when we did eat meat, <clears throat> we used to like the chili squid and that kind of stuff. And now they do uh, mushrooms, chili, chili squid style <laughs> mushrooms that like, look like chili squid. And uh, yeah, we are a fun. Oh, they're very nice. Even my daughter, you know, if I say mushrooms, there's me. It's like, no way. But um, yeah, we all, we all scoffed them. So that was probably our favorite meal. But I just, again, overconsumed. <laughs> and I, I wanted to buy, <laughs> I wanted to have a pint of tenons because I thought that was like the national lager of Scotland. But I never isn't Iron Brew the national lager of Scotland? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. So it's funny when I was walking around the street and people's drink, soft drink of choice was Iron Brew. <laughs> of course. It's no joke. Iron Brew in one hand and a fried Mars bar in the other. I know that's what Debbie Martin Consani has for breakfast. <laughs> I never had the Mars bar. Yeah, you know, I did Google like things, Scottish <laughs> snacks and Mars, deep fried Mars bar, but a lot of it was kind of meat based. So no, didn't, didn't have any snacks, Scottish snacks, but yeah, I had a wonderful time. And much running? Oh, well, loads of walking. I did two days of uh, running, but they were only small, about 10K, just running around Edinburgh with a camera filming <clears throat> stuff. But I'm really sensitive with YouTube when I'm filming things and um, say there's lots of building work going on. Nobody wants to see, you could be in the nicest city in the world, but no one wants to see a skip full of rubbish when you're running past it. You want kind of lovely architecture or nice vistas. So uh, it wasn't great. Oh, the seat was nice going up there, but how that turned out because... You're just kind of hearing me huffing and puffing <laughs> and slipping on rocks. I had road shit. Some people what? might like that, Gary. That might be some people's <laughs> choice. Massive idiot. So I only took one pair of shoes and they were road shoes. And after the seat is a trail up the top. So, And there were the uh, Nike Zooms with the massive... Stop it. You didn't take those. Yeah. <laughs> so Did I was... I always... If I'm going on a holiday or going somewhere, because you can run, you know, especially a holiday trip, you're not going to do a massive, you're probably going to do an hour of run massive, aren't you? And then you got your trail, you can, you got the ability to go on anything with a, anywhere. If you've got your road, the minute you had this saw came over, isn't it? I know, I should have. I, I knew as soon as you did the walk the day before, <laughs> I thought this is going to be a struggle <laughs> with my Nikes on. But yeah, yourself, come on then. So you're in Wales. Um, yeah, we decided. So they lifted the quarantine um, for French people to, la- to be allowed back in the UK without having to quarantine. So we were meant to come on holiday last week. There was a big family party. We couldn't come because we couldn't qu- because we would have to quarantine. Yeah. And then literally the day after this party that had been organized for like three years, they lifted the quarantine. So we arrived to the leftovers of the party and the sweeping up basically. But yeah, so it was a bit of a mad rush because I had this race on Saturday. And I think we decided like Thursday, right, we're going to go. So we had to book house sitter, dog sitter, book our travel, book our PCR test. Have you had a PCR test yet? No, no, I need to get one though for Valencia, but yeah. Holy shimoli, Dr. Ben at the pharmacy. He was like, have you heard of... I was like, no. And Bryn said, oh, I'll go first. And I thought we were just having like a swab in the mouth. Yeah. So I was not, you know, it wasn't me, but we had all the kids with us. And then Dr. Ben took Bryn in her back room and shut the door. I was like, oh. <laughs> Bryn came out, his eyes were like watering down his face. I was like, oh my God, he's like, it went up to my brain. Oh my God, no. <laughs> Honestly, it was so deep. I had to do my like contraction breathing as he did the second one. Cause I was like, oh my God, that's so painful. <laughs> I'm not being dramatic at all. Anyway, so we had to sort that out and um, do all these sort of forms, which nobody, then we, so it was really quite stressful. All these forms, all these tests, where we're going to be, we had to order tests for when we arrive here and we get to the channel tunnel and do they check anything? 
nothing. Yeah. This French lady had a clipboard which she was doing a tally sheet on because we're in a van, so I could see what she was writing. She literally had like a year three maths tally sheet. She was just like, "Are you double vaccinated?" And I said yes, and she just popped us on the tally sheet, and through we went. I had a similar <laughs> thing when I did our Paris Marathon. You had to have a medical certificate from a GP to see yeah. that you were yeah. able to run a marathon. And it, luckily, my brother-in-law is a GP, so it wasn't such a big deal for me. But a lot of people, it is a big, quite, quite a hassle. And again, they just tick the box. They don't even really look at it. Could have done anything. Could have been anything. Though now they've changed the law now. So anyone coming over to do any of the big French races, <clears throat> you have to, there's a, there's, an, there's a website now they've set up because all the English people were forging their certificates. And um, so now you have to upload it. And your doctor's like on this big database, you can't forge it. And you tick a box saying, if I'm caught forging, I'll be fined 40,000 euros. Oh my goodness. But it's a big thing in France because there's no national health service if yeah. you require medical or um rescue services on the mountain you have to have the interest in it anyway we did all the right things and we got through a 15 hours of driving in the van after an epic mountain race oh my god one point i actually we got to the services so excited about getting to english service stations because anyone that's driven through france knows that they are the pits of the earth the french one we got to the english one chose our service station obviously by the snack venue waitrose yeah. starbucks <laughs> i couldn't get out of the van i was like my knees literally i had to like like the tin man like yeah. oh but my knees <laughs> um but anyway yeah 15 hours of driving to get back here but all worth it to see the fam yeah and the sun's um, shining the sun is shining we've had a beach day we've had a rainy day and today we're doing a melange of a beach day and a cafe obviously um so let me tell me about your race can i start with saying my initial excitement of three races in four weeks was not the plan, not a good plan. I had this thought that I would be able to not do much training in between the races so that it wouldn't be stressful with when I didn't have childcare and trying to get out for runs and I could just look forward to do the races really hard at the weekend. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. I hadn't like the big R word, the recovery word in between. And I definitely, on my Sunday race where I got lost, but I still really worked hard at that race, even though I ended up in the wrong town. That the then and I only then had six days before I then had my next forty k three thousand one hundred meter climbing race. That wasn't enough, and I didn't really enjoy the week with the kids because I was really tired yeah. trying to recover, and they wanted to do stuff, and I was like, oh, oh can I just lie down? Um, so it wasn't perhaps the best plan. But I've climbed in all these races. I've learned loads. I've learned what I need to work on, um, and I got to run up my local hill with Ruth Croft, who was jogging as I was at 168. All right. So we set up, so this is our local trail race that goes all on my local trails, but we get a massive international field and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's a thousand people that do it, which is brilliant. I love it. So all these like really top famous. Yeah. And when you see them and they're all so small in real life, you're like, oh my God the size of my 10 year old child the men um and so we started in this square and i was like oh i'm not really recovered i wasn't really up for it i wanted to go to england we were setting off for england the next day i was like just let's get this done so we set off in the first climb straight up the first climb it's about 800 meters but it's like zigzaggy so it's not super steep okay, yeah um it took us about it took well it took me half an hour to go up i've run up it I think on Strava, it's like 104 times. It was the fastest time I did I've ever run up it hey. on this way because I was running along and I thought, I'm going to start like halfway back again because yeah. uh, it's really satisfying to go run past people than to go the other way. Um, I run along, got about halfway up and suddenly Ruth Croft jogs past me and I'm like, <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> So I was like, she was chatting to her friend. Um, I can't remember her name. Sorry. Um, and they were they were going to run it. They were run past. She was all in her Adidas gear. You know, I was like, oh, yeah. I know all that gear. <laughs> um, and the other girls were Scott Runner, and they jogged past me. And I was like, I've got to go with them. Sure, you got to, haven't you? you to... Well, if I could, I would. I was trying not to heavy breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, they. She was just so beautiful at this trail. So I was like, right, when Ruth is running i'm gonna run and when she hikes i'm gonna hike so i like I followed her up i was like oh this is, like, this is amazing 
amazing. This is just amazing. Me and Ruth in a race together. Um, and, and then oh, we got to the top and there's a bit of running, a bit of downhill. And I asked my legs the question, let's run. And they went, oh, really? Maybe. No, maybe. <laughs> anyway, Ruth, Ruth ran off into the distance. Um, uh, then there's another map. Then there's a 1,000 meter climb, and I just I didn't have any legs. So I was like, oh, people are overtaking me, which not normally I can hold my own on a on a climb. Yeah. Um, and got but got I was like, right, you you got to deal with the legs that the Lord has given you, and they weren't super strong on that climb. Got to the top, and it was re- it's more rain, really muddy, really probably, and it's a 1,000 meter descent. Oh my goodness. Really muddy, really steep. And I got to the top in about, I think I was fifth girl. So I was thinking, well, Ruth, the all elites ahead of me. I was like, it's good, it's good. It's strong start, not feeling great. And I was at the bottom in eleventh place, girl. Oh Lord. I just cannot run (laughs) as fast as the girls. And then so then I just spent the rest of the week the race working my butt off and slowly catching back up off um of uh, trying to catch up places, but then the big excitement. You thought that was the most exciting bit of the race. It wasn't. Got to um, just above my house, basically, to this lake where all my mates were waiting to cheer me and one mate was waiting with a bit of fuel for me. And there were storms due in at about three. And we were then now going up to about 2,600 meters. Yeah. Um, so we went, I went around the state. It was like chatting to my mates, like a bit of high fives, changing my fuel. <clears throat> and the doctor, the head of the uh, mountain rescue for that day, and the race director were standing there. <clears throat> and they said to me, you're the last person allowed up on the course, Eddie. We'll let you go. We've closed the course. And I thought they were joking because they were like, you've been so long getting here. <laughs> we're going to let you get up there. Uh, but go on, hurry. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so funny uh and off i went up this massive climb didn't think anything of it i did see them put tape across the course I mean, yeah <laughs> <laughs> they put tape across the course behind me but i thought well they're just kind of maybe making a different path round or something yeah, yeah, like, yeah. i honestly didn't think anything of it i was also then on a mission because it was then it's then two hours i knew it was about two hours from that bit because then it's all climbing up to the to the finish so then i was like on a mission that i was going to try my mates had said there's two girls within five minutes you can you can get them. Don't yeah. worry. The rest are gone, Eddie. <laughs> Forget them. <laughs> yeah. So I was then on an absolute mission to, um, and my local climb. So I know every step of it. So I had my head down. I was working hard. Anyway, got to the first top of the first climb. So it's sort of in two stages. And suddenly the clouds came in and the wind came up. And I was yeah. like, whoa, this is cool. And there's a big, lot you wouldn't like it, Gary. Big, long, really steep scrambling section. Yeah, and I planned to put my poles away, but I couldn't get the button of the pole. Uh, so I was like, "Oh no, I need it." It's like on you need a few hands to yeah. get the chains and stuff. I was like, "Well, I'm just gonna have to deal with that. I'll just deal with that." And we got round big, this big long scrambling section. You can see people like up high above you. You just have to focus on where your hands and feet are going and not look down. Would you feel like really exposed if you weren't comfortable? Super with that? exposed. There's nothing between you <laughs> and the family down in your house. Um, <laughs> who went around the fish? Suddenly saw my old neighbours coming down. I just love this. And they, <laughs> oh! <laughs> like quick, quick before the rain. I was like, rain. Oh Lord! And we went round this ridge. This isn't even the proper ridge bit yet. This is just to get to the circle. And the the cloud came in. So and I was like, oh my God! Fortunately, I knew the sort of path. It's like a really narrow ridge path, um, and it goes. It's about three hundred meters, but it's about four k round this bowl. Yeah. Um, but we couldn't see anything, could not see anything. And we started hearing the thunder and the lightning and the rain started. And I was in my vest and I couldn't collapse my poles to hold on. I was like, oh, Lord, just keep going. Fortunately, there was kind of, I was in like a kind of group of men that were better at the, like the technical scrambling bit than me. And then any little bits of running, yeah. I was like pushing on in the running. And then I could follow them on the scrambling bit. And I was just like, holding on. And it got to the worst bit, which is always bad, but it was epically bad because it's like slate rock. Yeah and raining thunder and there was a man just sitting on it crying <laughs> i've got vertigo i've got vertigo like, oh my goodness me i was like oh i can't i have to i can't i'm not good enough to stop on this and then help you across <laughs> so these guys like made this chain for him and got him across so that he didn't have to like look i was like i 
I'm just going to carry on, sorry. Um, arrived in Avoriaz in the biggest thunderstorm. And normally, they, you have to slide down snow to get down to Avoriaz. Yeah. I may have slid on my bum. Um, and normally, they bring you down the piste. It's along, it's about 500 meters down into the finish. But they'd obviously thought, no, let's take them down the rocks and the mud <laughs> for some more technical descending. Why no, not? no vision, nothing, couldn't see anything. And then you arrive. We arrived like on the pieces and I could not see where to go. And I thought, right, we've been in this situation last week. Just stop. And I just stood in the in the cloud and I just waited until somebody else came. And then I was like, well, where, where do we, where do we go? We sort of like just kept going forward. Eventually came to town. Lit and I and still I hadn't realized that they'd closed the course. So then I went through town. I was like, it's dessert. Where's all my like where's yeah, my cheering yeah. crew? I was <laughs> really working hard, you know, do 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 running up. Nobody there. Nobody there, literally. I got to the finish and Bryn arrived with the kids and he was like, It's all cl- the race, you know, you like the last one. <laughs> That's what it is. Right. But I'd passed like 20 people on this big ridge bit. Yeah. And so I was like, oh my God, the storm was so bad. Everything blew off. Like they were trying to do the prize giving and they literally couldn't hold on to the tarpaulin. Oh, Poor God. people. Um, it was meant. And I was like, God, there are so many people still out there on the mountain. Um, How big was the field? Sorry. There's about a thousand people. Oh my goodness, mate. Okay. So, and with the people that didn't make it. So they put them, so lots of my mates are doing it. So they put the barrier across and that was it. They were, had to hand in their bibs. Yeah. And that was their race over. So some people were really grumpy and like, but it was totally the right. I mean, the storm was, and I wasn't even in the eye of the storm when I went across the worst bit. And I know that bit yeah. really well. And I've been on that sort of exposed stuff and I'm not super mountain experienced so and the, so that anybody behind me perhaps would have been slower on that section well definitely oh, yeah. much slower. and it was the end of the race you know you're going into your third thousand meters of climbing people are going to be really tired um so it was totally the right call to to, to make 100 oh, you can't mess about you can't mess about um and i was very lucky that um they let me they let me through and what was the visibility like you know you said you couldn't see anything but five i mean you no, no, like you, your hand, like yes, it was. <laughs> but it was so. I didn't. I, I, I thought it was quite cool. It was a super adventure. Um, I was a bit disappointed that I hadn't been a bit more competitive. But I mean, looking back, it was. A, I'd asked a lot of myself the last few weeks, and all good miles, vert meters in the leg, all good experience. Yeah all good experience <laughs> and um and, and the poor kids so the kids were up waiting for me um in this torrential storm. they had shorts and t-shirt on bless them, bless them. they didn't complain once got back we, they were pretty drenched but they were amazing support so yeah done i'm having a little rest now yeah i was gonna say when's the next race a week saturday <laughs> no worries. i've got a, i've got an entry to another massive Trail du Don Midi, it's called, around this mountain range, the Don du Midi. Yeah. I've done it before. It's really cool. Uh, 60K, 4,500 metres climbing, a lot of climbing. It's in September. But I'm going to have a chat with Coach this weekend and decide whether I do that or whether I just – I'm definitely – I'm going back into base building now, definitely. <laughs> going to get some volume in. Yeah. Because there's been a lot of racing. There hasn't been much training the last month. Um, and I'm going to get some nice mountain – miles in my legs i might do that or i might miss that um and focus on some the london marathon um oh. i'm all about i've got to get a utmb five points in. i see okay so i've got to there's a number of races that i could do that in um and i'm lo- kind of being a bit cheeky and looking for the easiest race that i can get those five points well in. you and everybody else that's what they do isn't but it? then i think oh i should do a really hard one because that's good banking for that's good utmb practice mm. but then a lot more could go wrong if you do 100k and 6,000, 7,000 meters of climbing yeah. than if you do a flatter one where um it's slightly easier you know no no five point race i can't decide i'm going to let my coach like lead me on what the sort of build up because these i mean these three mountain races i've done have taught me so much yeah um about how useless i am still but it hasn't deterred me gary i'm like yeah, I, you know, I think i can get better i think i could keep with ruth for another climb i'm like that but it just shows like how 
the different level. Even on just like a local scene, say I do cross country, um, I, you know, the times I do for 5K and 10K, a lot of people would go, oh, I wish I could run that quick. But then these guys who then run your 15 minutes for a 5K, you just, it's, it's a complete another <laughs> level of, of ability. I was a bit sad that I was just like oh, a pretty useless attempt, but then, but then I'm like, you've got to get perspective as well, is that I have a whole other life, which yeah. I love. And I really value, I wouldn't be the person who would, my kids wouldn't be, I am, love being a mum with the kids, with the family, having a job, other thing. I love running. We love running, don't we, Gary? We yeah. love running, but I would never want it to be my my one thing, if I wanted to compete at the highest level, which obviously I'm good if I want to do, uh, um, it has to be your be all and end all. And I'm, I don't think for someone like me as well, probably like you too, Gary, that would be healthy. I wouldn't be able to, I couldn't let myself go into that all in because I not, I wouldn't be a nice person. I don't think. Oh, no, so, maybe 10 years ago, maybe I think I could probably kind of indulge myself, but <clears throat> No, no, we, like you say, it wouldn't, I know personally for me, it wouldn't be healthy. I'd make a lot of wrong decisions. <laughs> make wrong decisions. And I wouldn't, I think, but I think, see what's come out of this is like the kids, my oldest, like handing me gels and me going, there's not, can you go home? I need six more gels. I haven't got enough gels. And him like running home and coming back up the next checkpoint and going, I've got your gels, mom. You're doing really well. I'm so proud of you. Keep working. And that to me. That's worth anything that they yeah. see that and that hopefully then they'll yeah. take that when I'm at the start line of their races and them go and I'm like, so. Yeah, I much prefer a rounded life. with um, a as rounded life. Just a few <laughs> little podiums in there. What, what, what about your kids? You know, you had a bit of pole issues, but you were the bits oh, of... The, well, there was a pole story because I hadn't used my poles in the previous two races. So they were still together. I haven't used them since I went around Mont Blanc. So I'd left them outside, obviously. So on this race where it's a lot more climbing. So the night before the race, I decided to try and collapse them. But I didn't know. But now everybody has told me this, that you must keep them collapsed. Otherwise, yeah. they like fuse together. Yeah. So they were all fused together. So I cannot do this race without poles. Though may I add that Ruth didn't have poles. <sighs> Of course she didn't. Of course she's too busy on her phone. I wonder um, if she had them on her though. She just didn't choose to use them. Well, they weren't in the they weren't in the loop of the uh, Adidas store. <laughs> <you know? laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, um, so I had to make an emergency uh, pit stop down to Intersport and buy some incredibly eye-wateringly expensive uh, new poles. But I've been using these like old hiking poles for years because I'm too tight to buy any proper ones. Yeah, yeah. So now I've got some like proper lecky, like running really lightweight ones. I did feel. <laughs> don't make any difference but um Did yeah you that was, pack them down then i then i couldn't pack them down but then that was just user error because as soon as i stopped and actually Bryn was like you have to twist the handle and then press the button i was like all right all right <laughs> <laughs> uh the rest of my kit was great i had to do a few emergency patches on some chaffing because it was so wet the week before i chaffed terribly in some unmentionable places so i had to put a lot of um, tape on to my facility. Chaffing on chaffing. <laughs> oh, it's not fun, chaffing on chaffing. But uh, everything else worked well. Spring energy gels, they went down a treat. Shoes? Shoes, mascot, ultra tracks. Though I am going to try a different uh, trainer because I love the Scott ultra tracks for comfort, but wet rock and mud, there's not enough grip on them. Yeah. There's not enough grip on them. That's why I can't keep up going downhill. Nothing to do with technical ability, all to do Kit. with the grip on my trainer. <laughs> so I'm going to try some VJs. Um, I've got Very some, good. but I haven't worn them in yet, which is slightly better grip. I've got to throw everything I can at... Uh, the descending the finish don't mess about if the fins make them then i'm pretty sure it'll be a good bit of kit that special rubber isn't it Bu butyle listen it because they leave it exposed or something something like that yeah they cook i've it. walked around the house literally you stick to the floor around the house it like goes okay. um so i'm gonna give those a go um and see what happens so yeah, an eventful, an eventful few days, but what an adventure that was. And uh, I won't forget it. The Stormy Ridge Line, <laughs> Mr. Vertigo. <laughs> well, I wonder I what his, I wonder his I story thinking, is. As he was there, I was like, this is going to go down a treat on the podcast. You don't know it, mate, but you're going to be mentioned on a podcast. <laughs> 
Yeah, I wonder what his kind of recollection of events are. I always think sometimes, you know, when you could have five people somewhere and they all tell a slightly different story of what went on. This girl just came past me and pushed past me and said, I can't stop. Sorry. I think that would be his recollection. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh, well done, Eddie. Well done. Fantastic. Uh, right. This week, this week, we have a chat with Francis Mills, a bit of a different um, interviewee this week. Um, uh, but we, we have to apologize to Francis because we recorded this quite a while ago, but we finding the right slot to then fit in these interviews. But this one is uh, fits in really well to our episode 50 uh, show because I think it sort of encapsulates encapsulates what this podcast is all about adventure people doing incredible things ordinary people doing incredible things yeah. and setting themselves incredible challenges um and frances has set herself a an enormous challenge of walking the length coastline <laughs> yeah. of great britain and she's a very normal person um she talks about uh setting up this adventure what inspired her to do this adventure the uh the the little stories of the people she's met on the route so far. Um, and she, t she spins a wonderful yarn, doesn't she? I loved it. So here we are, our chat with Francis. In the summer of 2017, Frances set off on a journey which would see her mark a trail, a path through some of Britain's wildest landscapes, aiming to form a loop of almost 5,000 miles around the edge of Britain. She so far completed about 3,000 miles of this epic journey. And we wanted to um, catch up with Frances, find out all about her adventure, what inspired this adventure, what she's learned so far, and her plans for tackling the next stage, which I think might be the most epic the next <laughs> stage as she heads up north. Hi, Frances. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Frances. Hi, Eddie. Hi, guys. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what inspired this incredible journey? Sure. I um, grew up in the Cotswolds in Cheltenham, and um, it's surrounded by hills. So I was always dragged on walks by mum. And I'm sure when I was a kid, like she always says that we never wanted to go on them. But we always there's, there's always a theme, isn't there? Parents <laughs> dragging kids out. Yeah. But we always came back and we'd had, um, you know, we'd found a dead deer or a hedgehog or a whatever, we climbed a tree. And so I think that stayed with me. And one of the things that I became really um, intrigued by was where footpaths led and finding routes through cities or through the countryside. And so when I began to do a bit more running and walking on my own, I just have no plan and just follow them and see where they led, get completely lost and then have to make my way back. And that was you know, as much sort of training as I ever did. <laughs> And now you work for a company, you were just telling us about it, mm -hmm. which helps to inspire other people to go and do adventures. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I work for a company called Active England Tours, and I um, run most of their operations and as a tour guide as well. And we encourage people to explore throughout Britain when they're on holiday to go wild swimming, to do source to sea adventures, paddling, cycling, um, and we started in the Cotswolds as well and now do trips all the way through Devon and Cornwall, um, up into the Lake District, some Northumberland trips there. And it's essentially for people who want to be outdoors and active, whether they want five star hotels or glamping trips and fire pit dinners, we've got the whole spread there. And I think particularly after a year of COVID and the uncertainty about traveling abroad, and ha people having discovered some of what's on their doorstep, um, hopefully they'll want to explore a little bit more and come on holiday with us. Excellent. I certainly do. I like the <laughs> idea of the five-star <laughs> hotel. Um, yeah. So tell nice. us a little bit about this journey. What sort of made you think, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, with sort of right time, right place, you know, I'm going mm. to go off and walk around England. There was something in the back of your mind that you'd been sort of thinking about for a few years. I love actually the start of the article. I uh, do a quick, quick note to listeners yeah. is that I find Francis because um, I was reading an article in The Guardian and she'd written this article about this, um, about this journey. And I 
messaged Gary Strachway saying, we've got to get her on the show. I love the sound of this adventure. So um, this, can you tell us a little bit about what, how, this, how you planted the seed of this adventure? Sure. It was a whole combination of things. Um, I was sat in my living room watching a documentary about the artist Richard Long, who um, has done some extraordinary walking adventures and has really encouraged people to think about art as a moving, dynamic um, adventure, really. And his artworks span kilometres because his artwork is the walking that he does. And so I though not very artistic myself, thought that's really cool. I had never thought of journeying as being a form of art. And to be honest, I'm not sure that's at all what I've achieved. It's Probably just an excuse. Probably couldn't think that in your tent. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't feel very artistic to just be rained on week after week. But um, it, it really helped started a fascination with things like footpaths and rights of way and being outdoors because I know I feel happier having gone for a run in the morning I, I'm setting myself up for the day yeah. and I thought well why stop in the morning why not go for a run and make that the whole day and then start again tomorrow and I um a huge sort of catalyst for it was I met a girl called Elise Downing who if you haven't interviewed you should because she has done the entire coast of Britain in one go um and i met her at a festival and just thought she's my age she's done it you know she didn't run an awful lot beforehand i yeah. could do something like that and um that's really where it all started just piecing all of these interests together and what did your mum say when you said uh mum i'm heading out the door <laughs> <laughs> she said can i come <laughs> Um, she, yeah, she said, but I, I don't want to run it. And I said, <laughs> yeah, it was tricky. Um, so no, it was, I think my dad was a bit, um, concerned for some of the parts and made me, and quite rightly get a spot tracker. One of these, um, things that beams out my location yeah. and has an emergency beacon in case I fell off a cliff or I don't know what was going through his head. <laughs> yeah. Never had to use it. Um, but other than that, it was a sort of, well, you should you should probably have the first couple of nights <clears throat> accommodation in case anything goes wrong. And then, uh, to be honest, I didn't. I, I wild camp on the first night, so that didn't happen either. But there was lots of good intentions and good advice there. And then I sort of went by and <laughs> just headed off on my own. I'm really it's curious just... about Kit. How, how did you kind of decide what you needed how did you carry it did you stash it and stuff like that yeah I'm really curious about that I um actually had a bit of an issue trying to figure out what I would need because I've never um I've been bike packing before and you have multiple panniers and you don't have to carry it and that's yeah. really easy and I managed to get everything in um to an OMM or on backpack it was yeah. about 32 liters um and stretched it to yeah. its limits <laughs> and then realized I hadn't added water or food so I had to unpack everything again and um I got a lot of advice I just turned up at there's this great store um Trek it in Hereford I think it's okay. a family-run place and just sort of turned up and I said, what do I need? And then they showed me all of this really expensive stuff. And I went, okay, but if I can't afford that, what yes. can I get? And then they started pulling out lots of tents with slight holes in that you could patch up and, you know, okay. stuff that was slight rejects. And I built up um, quite a good selection of very lightweight kit. Um, it was not necessarily the most functional kit yeah. but it was very lightweight and that was my priority so it's it was um a whole mixture i got a nordisk telemark tent uh, very yeah. low lying to the ground green so that it was a, quite inconspicuous a very lightweight sleeping bag that didn't always hold up to the low temperatures but it was <laughs> it was on the border um yeah. and just made it up i figured i was close enough to really just running through villages every day that if I really okay. had an issue, I could just catch a bus to a, a local Cotswold Outdoors or something and, and replace the kit. Did it evolve along the way though? Did things change? You know, I don't, I don't need this stove or whatever it was. Yeah, I um, there were a few things that I never really used. I used 
my pen knife once and it was really um, an embarrassing use. I think I had to cut open an avocado and I was thinking when I bought it <laughs> that I would need to be chopping up kindling for wood and that didn't happen. Um, but most of the kit was really pretty durable. My tent broke um, during Storm Fion when that hit. Oh gosh, I forget what year that would have been and had to replace that, which took a bit of time. Yeah. I replaced my sleeping bag eventually because it got completely destroyed. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. Did you go a little <laughs> bit warmer this time? It, well, I actually got the same one again because it was it was lovely and it was goosed down. It just didn't really stand up to, to being damp all of the time. So um, there were bits and bobs that I had to replace and shoes being another huge one. I got through about five different pairs of trail oh, wow. shoes. And how was wild camping? It's... Uh, it terrifies me to be honest um <laughs> my experience well uh, i did some backpacking in australia so we had to kind of rock up in car parks in the middle of the night oh my um, goodness a few interesting incidents um badly bad choice of car park in just outside of melbourne one night i was yeah pretty oh, pretty, scared, pretty scared but yeah how did you find the wild camping well, there are definitely, I would say, places I would avoid and car parks would be one of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, I haven't really had too many bad experiences with it. I think it's easy enough if there's one of you, if you've got a very small tent. Um, yeah. Obviously, you, you don't leave anything behind and try and not um, rock up too early. And don't, you know, you can't set up your tent at 3 p.m. when it's still middle of the day and there's dog walkers everywhere. Yeah. Um, but in general, I've only came across um, one landowner who wasn't that happy to have me on, but she okay. thought I was on drugs. So there was a bit of a miscommunication. She'd obviously had some issues before, asked me if I was homeless and was sort of like, you need to now leave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was already, it was in the morning and I was awake and I had my sort of tea on the go and I was packing up my tent and you're all at ground level. So any animals, sheep, cows, dogs that you come across are yeah. suddenly in your face. Yeah. And her two greyhounds came up and they were right there. And I thought, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And, um, but I think she was more off put and shocked than I was because she wasn't expecting me to be there, but we, we had a lovely conversation and then she carried on walking and I carried on running. So it's an instant with some cows in a field. Yes. I, the reason I now don't set up my tent until it's dark is because I set up, um, I got to this lovely, very unassuming field, green grass. It was easy to put my tent pegs into. Um, it had a quite a nice view over, it sort of went down and you could see the sea and I thought yeah. this is perfect and I'm knackered, I'm just going to get a really early night and um, got in my tent, was just reading my book and suddenly I heard this thundering and I thought, oh my goodness, that doesn't seem right, there can't be a storm and so I looked out and there was just about 40 cows coming into this field and I thought, oh my god, and they were running because they were being herded. And I leapt out of my tent, like yeah. shoes off, nothing, like squelching in the mud. All the tent pegs came out. I zipped everything up and I threw the whole thing over yeah. this nearby metal grate. And then myself launched after it oh my and goodness. just caught my breath and watched as these cows sort of got curiouser and came closer and then settled down. And I thought, right. <laughs> <was terrifying>. <laughs> <laughs> what kind can of things you did you it? eat? Oh, was sorry, it, you, can. you know, these... Um, really kind of high calorie stuff or did you have to rock up to cafes and pubs and stuff like that yeah i mean um there were occasions where i had days and i had a village i'd assumed that most almost every village in cornwall where i started you know has a pub which is great and even in the winter it's got locals in it um but occasionally I'd forget that it was a Monday and that none of the pubs were open and yeah. everything was shut and I would go you know would miss out and it would be porridge for for a few meals but in general um because none of these areas around Britain are that remote you can normally find a cafe pub or shop at least yeah. once a day or once every two days and plan for it and um so I had a lot of big cheesy chips meals <laughs> in pubs roast dinners Cornish pasties oh. um 
And when I was Eddie. on the go, if I, <laughs> <Perfect>. selling it <laughs> to Gary, it was, it was amazing. There was definitely a big foodie trip for me. And every time, because you've got to stop and you've got to take breaks, you can't, I wasn't really racing it. So if I saw a cafe, I was right there eating my cake and, you know, doing Love some it. But I think if I, I try to stay indoors, stay overnight in an Airbnb or couch surfing at least once a week um, yeah. to just replenish stocks and rest and stretch. And I would try and get some, like salmon was a great meal, you know, just packaged up for the next day and lots yeah. of more vegetables, which I struggled to get on a daily basis without yeah. being able to cook. So um, I would try and do that. And you start to crave it. All of these really fatty foods like peanut yeah. butter, avocado, salmon, really oily. I, I found myself like, heaping mayonnaise on things just to try and make sure that I was um, eating enough and of the right foods, I suppose. Sort of. And what about drinking? Um, you must have had to carry enormous amounts of water. Do you have like, sometimes I'll carry a filter when I'm out on the trails and things to top yeah, up. Yeah, I do. I have a... Um, I bought a filter. That was actually one of the things I never had to use yet. Uh, I think Scotland's going to be different, but um, mostly every cafe I went to, or pub or anything like that, I just asked them to fill up. Um, I had a Sawyer water pouch, these blue okay. pouches you can roll up really small when you're not using them, and then just place them at random angles on the outside of my backpack. Um, yeah. And one of them broke once, and that was a real oh. nightmare because oh it went... Goodness everywhere I, I don't even know if it broke or if I hadn't screwed on the lid but I jogged along for a long time before I realized it seeped all the way into my bag and then out oh. <laughs> um but in Not general into the I didn't sleeping find it bag. Initially. yes yeah that that was sadness <laughs> <laughs> so how did you go about um uh I'm interested in how you went about did you do much training in preparation for this or did you sort of, as you got going, I'm sure you did as well, get fitter as you went through the yes. challenge? Um, uh, and also then did you sort of plan each day or did you kind of just go as far as you could and it got dark and you camped? So it was a mixture. I <clears throat> have... I had before I did this trip um, done a few marathons, although not that recently. It's very cute. Hi, Rex um, has just appeared. <laughs> you like in the chat? He's liking the story. <laughs> um, so I knew I could run that far, um, but I hadn't done any specific training. I just knew that I could go for, a, um, I think I was sort of comfortable at about 10 miles. Um, but that was about it and started at a, between 15 and 17 miles, knowing I had essentially a full day to do it and then built up um, over the days just and weeks until I was by the end of each section. I was running marathons each day or I would finish on a really long day of sort of 30, 35 miles. And um, normally because I was running out of time, but it, it's definitely got to be a progression and if you get too tight, it, I would quite often run, say, 15 or 20 miles in the morning and then just walk in the afternoon mm. and just try and get the distance covered, but also slow down a bit and look a bit more at what I'm passing and just getting that sort of rhythm and miles under the belt without pushing it too far. Did you find as the time went on and the weeks gone, your body kind of naturally got used to moving that much every day and it became more natural than a sort of forced um yeah. habit yeah you start to really crave it it's to the point where you think how how will I ever not do this I'm gonna have to mm. go back to work at some point and I'm gonna have to not run not get up and run every day it's a really odd feeling because you're just so used to having all of this energy and the more you do it yeah you'd think you'd run out of energy but actually you just get more and more energy and it's quite a weird tapering effect when you stop to have to I, I don't know. I, I've, I've detox a, from it a bit. Yeah, a little bit and stop eating five meals a day. <laughs> you know, there's that as well. You have to sort of remind your body that actually I don't need all of these things um, in the weeks after you stop. I, I, you have to go back to normal there as well. I know um, in the Tour de France, they have to like decondition them. They can't just stop. The cyclists have to carry it. Like even on their, when they have a rest day, they yeah. still cycle for like two hours because they can't stop them because if they stop, they just stop 
and stop training, the hormones and everything, the crash and burn is huge. So they like detrain themselves when they've been going for three weeks. I read something about that when Eddie Izzard did his marathon a day for however many days, 26, 27 days, that he was told you can't stop. And that worried me because I thought (laughs) I just planned on fully sleeping for a weekend. But um, I think naturally you do want to go out. And even if you go for a really long walk and it's a bit different, you you want to keep moving. Um, But yeah, I've never found any... um, adverse effects from it other than I guess the sort of post people talk about like a post expedition lull where you 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 get slightly disjointed when you um slip back into normal life and again I think because this adventure was so physically close to home and I was still as it was as if I'd been on holiday which was fantastic obviously it didn't really I didn't I didn't have any of that either so I think I've been quite lucky how are your feet yeah Strong. <laughs> I think <laughs> I've been really lucky. I never touch wood. Um, <clears throat> my I don't seem to get blisters. Um, I don't seem to get injuries that much. Um, if I do, it's because I've had a physical. I've fallen over. Yeah. I had um, but but no twinges or occasionally sore knees that started yeah. to have an effect. But um, the one injury I did have was I was walking jogging out of um, a little village in Cornwall where my friend had come and we'd walked for a day so that she could join and we'd had a lovely pub meal. I left her and then started again around the coast and I thought I'll just catch up on some text messages and so I was jogging and texting which I wouldn't recommend. No. (laughs) And it was a I mean it was stupid because there was a cliff to one side. (laughs) So I was jogging a lot it wasn't right it was you know this far away jogging along and I just caught something on my foot and the momentum of both me and my heavy backpack threw me into the ground. Uh, I've never fallen so hard before and I thought, oh, I've done something bad here. And over the next week, my leg just started to change colour and it went through the rainbows. And I had, um, fortunately, um, I mean, I had to walk for about two and a half weeks. I just couldn't run more than three, five miles before I just, it got too painful. Um, But I had really luckily um, arranged to stay with a lady who I'd met a couple of weeks before walking her dog on a section of coast. And she says, oh, I live what will be a couple of weeks down the road from you. When you get there, give me a call. And so I went, hi, I'm Frances. You met me randomly on top of that cliff. Could I take you up on my offer? Because I've just I've had a fall and it would be great to just rest up for a day. And as soon as I got there, there was gin and tonics, like have a shower, here are our dogs. And I was like, this is amazing, cuddling dogs. There was a fire. And they said, we're going to a carol service. And I was like, this is amazing. And you just enter into their lives for a day. And I was so well looked after by this complete stranger and her family. Oh my um, that was going to be one of my next questions was, did you yes. encounter some yeah, wonderful acts of, of kindness along the, um, yeah. along the trail? And was it quite bizarre? You know, you, you, when you do these big challenges all by yourself, you sort of, in, you become a sort of, you're living inside your head a little bit, aren't you? And then to suddenly realize that real life is going on. Yeah, it, it's, it's odd because, because I set out never to do too much I sort of had an idea of if it got too painful or if I, you know, if I didn't want to go any further or if I stopped, if I had breakfast and I thought, no, I think I just want to just explore this town all day or there's a castle that looks really interesting. I could do that because um, because you're on your own time and I knew that I could get more miles on other days. And um, so you do start to wonder why people think what you're doing is is impressive because you're doing it very much on your own no one's telling you to do it and you don't feel I didn't feel like some days I felt like I was really challenging myself and on others it was just wonderful and it was you know really really nice to have that freedom um, to plan your own days but when you meet people 
and it is sleeting and you are out in the middle of nowhere and it's getting dark and you don't know where you're sleeping, but you have an idea on a map and um, you've been, you, you know, you've done 25 miles that day and you've camped for two nights prior and they go, that's mad. You go, oh yeah, it is a little bit. <laughs> I forgot that. And that's where this sort of disconnect happens or you call home and they're sat watching the TV. Oh, yes. You know, and you think, oh, that would be quite nice. <laughs> yes. So I think moments where you do meet people who are that kind and who have reached out um, and it always happens more quite fortuitously. Uh, there was another storm Storm Brian, I think, or we had the beast from the east. And on, during all of these storms, there were people who had been following my journey just from a distance through um, either Adventure Queens or through uh, various different Facebook groups. And I would post every now and then. Um, and they would say, you're actually getting close to where I live. Can we put you up for the night because it will snow for the next three days? And I thought, yeah, yeah that's that, that would be great. Thank you. And then you sort of arrange a meeting and you're just sort of jogging along a road and meeting a random stranger and I've had people drive past me before and stop and reverse and you think oh god because you know what's happening yeah and they say are you Francis and I go is it a good thing that they know who I am yeah. I'm not sure and they go no you're staying at my house tonight I'm Steve or whatever and I think oh, okay that's good <laughs> It's it's really really random, but I think those are those fantastic moments that really just bring the whole thing together and what what I remember out of the trip. Yeah. Do you ever feel lonely at any point? I think there's a difference between being alone and being lonely, and I think actually if you're have cho if you've chosen to go out and do something on your own and. To be honest, a lot of people came and joined for sections, whether they were walkers or runners or just wanted to camp or joined me on a rest day. So I had a lot of people coming in and out. But on the days when I was alone, I was surrounded by the landscapes I wanted to explore or there was always something to do. And if you have a point at which you want to get through on the day, it just doesn't. I, I didn't I didn't feel lonely um and if I ever had a really miserable time of it or occasionally and it's just cold and wet and you just think oh I'll try and get through um to the morning and then it'll be fine again I could just pick up the phone mostly there there were sections of Wales where there wasn't any signal but in general there was always you know someone a friend or family to call you mentioned about um, checking your map for where you're going to camp earlier how is your map reading? Is that a strong point? Not great. <laughs> Not great. I think I need to put myself on an orienteering course. Um, you do get better. I have OS maps on my phone, which was yeah. the best investment I could have ever got. And that shows you where you are on the map, also which way you're facing, which is yeah. useful. Um, but funnily, as a tour guide, I just to reassure anyone who will come on my holidays, I do know where I'm going. But if we happen to get sidetracked and look around the concrete factory, that's definitely part of the itinerary. Bonus, yes, free bonus. The itinerary. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff that you couldn't pay for, really. It's those out of brochure experiences. <laughs> um, no, I, I did get quite lost. On the first day that I, I started in Bristol, and went down <clears throat> through um, Devon and in towards the southwest coast path. And on day one, I ran out. I was super excited. I went across um, the bridge and ended up in this, this sort of forest and woodland area. And then I went around it about three times before I found oh, my way out. Goodness. And I thought, oh, I'm not ready to do this many miles. I've wasted the day, you know. Yeah. And you have to just take it all as part of the adventure. Do you think it gave you a kind of a greater understanding of kind of distance and and time you know sometimes i jump in a yeah. car and you're somewhere in five minutes but to get there on foot is it takes quite a long time you do have to live in the slow lane for a while and take everything just slowly know that it's going to take you a while to get from place to place and you forget that when people say <clears throat> i'd like to join you or you know you're making arrangements I forget how easy it is for people to just hop on a bus because yeah. I wouldn't be taking the buses or to, um, I think I mentioned it once I um, came home every Christmas cause it was a nice break and I decided why not have a full roast dinner and some social. And um, 
I had run on the first time part of my trip, I'd run for two months around the Southwest Coast Path and I'd got to, I can't remember where I was, Dorset or somewhere, um, maybe even nearer to, to London. And I thought, gosh, I haven't planned how to get home. And I was worried it would, in my head, it was going to take me weeks to get from Dorset to Cheltenham. Yeah. And I looked up on the bus, uh, yeah, on the train line or whatever, and it was two hours. And I two thought, hours. I could have gone home every evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, commute. Exactly, exactly. And I did take advantage of that, particularly with friends in London when I was running around bits of Kent. And I thought, well, people commute this distance to work. No, and if yeah. it, you know, the weather was getting a bit miserable or I, I fancied you know, to see more people, I could do the day, run into London and come out. And, and that made it a very cozy adventure in parts. It was yeah. it was a different adventure in Kent to in Wales. There was yeah. you know a bit of a contrast there in terms of distances to get places. And did you have a, a particular so far? I know it's not finished, but so far a, a favorite part of the country that you've run around? Yes, I think for me the Lake District is mm. just a magical. Oh, place. Gary, it is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you'll know it's it's wonderful and I did a lot of the coast around the Lake District up until the coast to coast path but then I came in and wiggled around a bit before I went back to the coast because oh, I just thought I've got to take some extra days to go and do some fell running and go and swim in the lakes and and I got it at um I did the Lake District at that wonderful easing of restrictions last autumn was my northern section of the journey and I was out for about five weeks and it was just the perfect combination of weather uh I I got I wasn't used to getting a particular tan on these winter expeditions yeah. but because it was autumn um it was it was magical yeah and actually I would also want to say this my second favorite place not necessarily because of the landscape but because of where I was when the beast from the east hit i was in norfolk and i was a couple of weeks from the end of my journey and i got taken in by this wonderful um lady who was a really keen walker and her husband who was a vicar and we went on safe some... hands safe yes, hands there, aren't exactly. you? <laughs> yeah he actually came and picked me up um five minutes from their house because it, it was getting very very snowy and was starting to be a bit impassable and um I saw the collar first. I thought, right, good, safe. Mum um, would be happy. <laughs> Mum would be happy. Um, and this lady came and walked. Um, she's called Casey, and she walked with me for 15 miles through snow that was about this thick on sand. And we came across a seal oh. com um, colony, and it was just a moonscape. I couldn't believe where I was walking. Um, and there was... I don't know what you call them, like shards of ice that had dripped down and looked like tusks hanging everywhere. And it wasn't oh the goodness. picture of Norfolk I had in my head. It wasn't the picture of Britain at all. Yeah. Um, and seeing a landscape change, I think doing these expeditions in the winter um, has been because I work during the summers quite intensively. But it also means that you get to see Britain when it's a little bit emptier, when there are just the locals around, perhaps. And it's completely different it's a quieter land to to move through gosh you're selling this to me i'm i'm you should do I'm, it no. <laughs> come and join uh, <laughs> um what would you say so far on the adventure we know we're only sort of three quarters of the way through what would you be your biggest what are you going to take into the next two thousand miles your sort of biggest learning so far i think mostly that it's if you go on these journey, journeys, you put a lot of pressure on yourself If because I do plan rough distances so that I know how long it's mm. going to take and where I can stay. But if you don't make them or you want to do more, there's nothing stopping you from doing either. And I think the key is that no one's really watching. No one's as invested in your own journey as you are. So you might as well make it enjoyable and if that means if you're training for something you know i i use this a lot to train for my some ultra marathons where you are really doing it for a bit more speed and time which is not something i'm that great at but it doesn't your training is your own and if you're starting to get injured or tired or you need more food just stop and make sure that you're looking after yourself um and the other 
I guess the other factor would be get the right kit for you and don't be afraid to switch it out. There are some cheap deals out there and it's not um, it's not an impossible challenge to try and fit everything into a backpack, although it can feel like that. All right, it's my turn to um, ask the deep and gritty question, Eddie. Ah, this is <coughs> Gary's oh, favourite tent. part. <laughs> you're in your tent, you're all zipped up, there's no cows in the field, your iPad's fully charged. Yeah. What would you... Um, what you what you what you're watching how you're what am I watching I like really um I like sci-fi and fantasy fiction and I like watching things um whether I'm watching it on tv or I'm listening to an audiobook which I do quite a lot I like hearing about adventures where people are having a worse time than I am so they're being chased by monsters or they're whatever it is they're on yeah. you know stuck in space and they can't get back and I think Oh, my tent's pretty cozy, actually. I, quite, <laughs> I could do this. And it, it, I like it because it takes you out of your own world. And if you just need an hour to switch off, um, it's the perfect escapism. The other thing is to listen to actual people doing real life challenges that are you know, much, much uh, more trying than you are. I whizzed through all of Ross Edgley's books and um, then went on to read about all sorts of fantastic athletes and adventurers and, and all of that and expeditions that people have had. Um, so I do quite enjoy that as well. Is there any treats that you kind of particularly look forward to at the end of the day? My mum makes the most amazing flapjack and it is, there's nothing that beats it. And it's, she tries to make it healthy and then I just add extras in when she's not. You're like, don't bother, mum. Don't bother. <laughs> that syrup. I want, exactly. I want all the seeds and nuts and I want all of, you know, I, I really enjoy eating fairly healthily, but yeah. I do want extra dollops of peanut butter and, <laughs> and more, car you know, more sugar and carbs as well. And if you match it with a cup of tea, then you, you're at home wherever you are. I liked that you said that in your article that the, mo the most important thing was the cup of tea in the morning because I I I would struggle but would to do anything without yeah let's raise the mic <laughs> without and and I can imagine when you wake up a little dry mouth a little bit dehydrated knowing that you can have a you can make yourself a cup of tea and I can imagine you sitting outside your tent like now what shall I do today yeah <laughs> It sets you up so well. It's just so comforting. It can be super cold, super hot. And I am a bit of a tea addict, um, but it, I don't, I mean, who is What's it? What's your tea bag of choice? This is a make or break question. Oh, I mean, if I was going really out there, I'd say Yorkshire gold, but- um, Very if, select. Uh, yeah. But to be honest, anything with a bit of, I can't do fruit teas. Oh no, I can't no, do them I'm with you there. That's not they tea. They smell like squash That's, and they are yeah. disappointing. Taste like pea. Exactly. Smell like squash, yeah. taste like pea. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got to be milky. That's oh, the other yes. thing. Milky oh, yes. brew. I tried um, some um, home brand. I won't say the name of the popular supermarket. And I thought it was fine, but then we ended up with some Yorkshire tea and I realised what I'd been missing out on for, <laughs> for months. I've just, had, I've just had to spend 80 euros to get PG tips over here no. because I used to be, mum used to deal me on the black market and just send a big box every few months just full of PG tips. And now we're not allowed to because of custom tax. Oh. It costs her more to, me more to receive it than it'd be worth. So I've just had to buy 80 euros worth. It is about a thousand 2000 tea bags but i can't live without pg tips nothing Same else either. don't give me any of this <laughs> yorkshire tea i need it brown and dark yeah <laughs> um uh what's the plan for the next 2000 miles is there time scale is there i think there so my plans are I've, i'm working this summer and then i'm actually going back to studying for a year um, that's a pretty intensive year long course. So I think I'll come out of that and potentially <clears throat> that will be the time to go and run around Scotland. And there are so many different routes that people take. Um, there is a guy called Nick Butter who is doing a run around Britain as we speak. So I'll probably have a look at where he runs and piece together different people's um, journeys and I probably will have to plan a lot further in advance because some of these areas are a lot mm, more remote. Mm, mm. And if I have a choice, I think Scotland is not one to do in the winter. So I think I will be trying to avoid midges and bad weather somehow. Yeah. And, yes. and find a I think, I think kind of spring, isn't it? It's like a May, 
Yeah, I think now's items. the time to be doing yeah, it. Yeah, now is the time. I did the Kate Rath Ultra and the midges were bad, but they weren't like net over your head bad. I'm like going to have to ask you about that because the uh, entry is open today. Yesterday. Well, I know I got the email. I got, oh. And I was like, oh, it's just quite expensive, isn't it? It is. I'm going to, I've sort of thought not this year, but next year, 2023. I guess it will be 2023. I I would yeah like some advice on how to complete that. <laughs> That's an adventure. That is. Well, I an hope adventure. you get lucky with the midges. I've heard some horrendous midge oh, stories. <laughs> they're so miserable and constant and itchy. And constant oh. and especially when you're sweaty and you're tired and you're like wanting to lie in your tent and you can and you're just like oh they're up my they're in my leg anyway anyway it's yeah. great it's great you'll love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what would you say to anybody listening to this that and I absolutely gosh you've just like inspired me I love the way that you've described this adventure like um the way that you've approached it and um all the sort of the way you've approached it with your own personality you know you've been like this is how I want to do it so this is how I'm going to do it and I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to learn from it and so many things nowadays especially with social media people feel that they need to go do it fast hard stronger than anybody has ever done it before and you know and and so much of adventuring isn't that it's about your own personal journey and I love the way you've talked about that what would you say to anybody who is thinking or wanting to do an adventure have you got any sort of top tips on where to start what to do I think I think mostly it is about that making it your own um not all of us are fortunate enough to have time off work for example so people who are doing these multi-month adventures and trying to run around Britain say if it is that that you'd like to do in nine months that's a really long time to take off work that was what I had originally planned on doing and then realized it was going to be for me quite impossible to fund and that I'm better off working in between and finding work that I enjoy that will, um, and a, a very kind boss that will you know, com- accommodate that. Um, I think sometimes if you are trying to do something that long, um, whether you want to do a particular footpath or you want to swim a certain distance, whatever it is, you can you can build it into your own lives. And I think um people like Alistair Humphrey have have really tried to get people to bring adventure into their back garden if you can't get out with your kids to go camping just do it in the back garden and run back in when you've forgotten the ketchup to go with your barbecue you know I think you can do a lot of adventurous things without having to go abroad necessarily I I mean there's a lot out there to explore but you can do things closer to home and you can spend you know weekends going and doing these trails and you can invite people to join in with you and that makes it makes it all the better um so there's there's a lot you can do without it having to seem overwhelming and I think just taking each day as it comes and um having a level of planning but also not really worrying if it if it doesn't go according to that plan or you know you get a little bit off track or you actually want to do something that's not on your schedule um you should just do it because that's the bits that you're going to remember i think those are good life lessons gary yeah some great (laughs) advice there (laughs) well i really loved our chat that was fantastic and i'm pretty sure our listeners will too thanks for coming on the podcast not at all it's been a real pleasure best of luck with the next we will get we will uh we will be avid followers now and um hopefully maybe we'll get a live podcast when she's at cape wrath um like oh, that Fridge. tim will be asking us to do <laughs> you put that in yet good luck good luck with the, the yes with the studying and uh getting your your life back to normal now that you can take people back on um yeah. back on adventures gosh I, I think your people listening to this will be like i'd like to go on an adventure with france especially if there's tea she's selling well, tea quite tea and and queen of the snacks yeah, yeah be like, uh, your mum's flapjacks is that part of the deal i have done that before yeah they've gone down well <laughs> If any of them make it between, you know, her giving it to me and then me passing any on. I love it. We'll speak to you soon, Francis. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Bye. Yeah, what a great chat that was, Eddie. Love that. And it was like you say, said earlier, it's been such a while since we 
actually did the interview. It was really nice to catch up with Francis again <laughs> when, I, when I've kind of edited the podcast. So yeah, really good. Um, I'm not too sure I'd like the, the wild camp and the, in the fields. That's a bit, a bit oh, scary. Oh, I love that. As long as it was by myself, I wouldn't want to do it with the whole family. Well, no, it's the, it's the farmyard animals that would kind of freak me out. And stuff no, like that. it's just a little cow, Gary. <laughs> They're massive. <laughs> So yes, right. Upcoming races. Um, what we got? Well, local to me is the Branches and Bears. It's Trail Outlaws, roughly ten k, a bit of coastline and nice local deans. Now I'm going to be there with my camera and my GoPro again. You know my little. Um, I filmed people at Pooley Bridge. I've had like oh, thousand... I went down a storm. That a thousand people have watched it. People love watching themselves, don't they? I hate it, Carrie. Oh, do you ever, when, when they say the race photos are up, I would never look at them. I'd never look at them. <laughs> oh, I do check them out. Yeah. It, if it was me and Ruth, obviously. I'd try that <laughs> yeah. one, frame it. <laughs> no, yeah, you know, I do check them out, but very rarely do you take a flattering um, photograph. But yeah, the people did like my little YouTube videos. I'll do one again this week at the Branches and Beers. <clears throat> but there won't be the same amount of people, like late in the 50s, enormous fields. So that's probably why quite a few people watched it. But, you know, what? I think with YouTube, because I'm not an entertainer, you see, there's a few things with YouTube is you either entertain, funny, or you offer a service, Um and my service is very small. It's like a few people doing a few hundred people doing a race, but that kind of ticks for me. One of the YouTube rules. I'm not a vlogger. You'll very rarely see me talking about what I'm doing in Edinburgh and ruining the whole family's day <laughs> with my video camera. But I think I do like to maybe film my journey up to Arthur's seat and um, then somebody might make the right trainer's choice if they ever try and try not and make her flies. Yeah, not my baby. Nobody fly. would do that. Only a prize. Well, I did see some uh, not appropriate footwear up there. I wasn't alone. <laughs> what else we got? Oh, go on, sorry. Panthers Dales Way Challenge. 36 hours to compete 82 miles. Yeah, that would be very good. That would be very good. I fancy the... Uh, we're going to get um, someone from Punk Panther actually on the show to have a chat. We've just got to schedule... All of the details of that, so I'll be quite good to catch up with those guys. Another, you know, you've got Hard Moors and the Punk Panther series and the Trail Outlaws. So these people, you know, uh, I know races are kind of opening up now, but for the past 18 months, it's been pretty challenging for all these guys. So yeah. looking forward to that chat. All Let's right, talk then. a few race results. I must forget people that have done proper races and not just prattered around on mountains <laughs> with their poles. Kate Rath, Kate Rath. Ran after a year and a half of waiting. Sally Fawcett was the female winner and Ian Stewart was the male winner. Looks like the weather was kind. I had a client doing it who just sent me midges with main terrible emojis afterwards. So I think they really suffered <laughs> with the midges. But um, it's great to see, again, that, that company, um, the Aria Events, get back up and running. I know lots of people will be training for Dragon's Back, which is... Uh, yeah approaching well done sally and in on the win there um north fans way 100 uh we talked about this coming up uh norbuck mihalik 16 hours 34 that's steaming fast on that course it's hilly course yeah not, you know not long climbs but loads of up and down and round and muddy and in the trail and the weather was awful i think they had almost a 50 percent dnf it was atrocious, a bit like Ridgeline weather. Um, and Hannah Rickman won in 20 hours, 56 minutes for the ladies. Ooh. And I had a message this morning from Anna Troop saying she was setting off this weekend to try and beat uh, Sabrina Vijay's Pennine Way FKT. This woman is She's so busy. <laughs> machine. Before she did Lakeland, I was like, that. That's going to be a disaster. Lakeland will be a disaster. She can't be recovered. Then she went and won it. But she did message me and say it was really, really hard. Yeah. I had to dig really deep. That was really, really hard. But three weeks, is it, since Lakeland? Is it might even be, three weeks? It might be two. And she's oh. going to go for this pandemic. But let's, if Anna can do it, she can do it. She what I'm to... impressed with is the, the, the physical recovery is tough, but the mental. I know. It's, ignorance isn't bliss, Fana. She knows exactly what is ahead. And I just, oh. I mean, we all feel it just after like 
I'm like, I don't, you put your, putting your head in that space to me, I yeah. can only do that really a couple of times a year. And then I don't want to, you know, it takes me probably, yeah, people will get this. It takes a lot of mental drive to finish these really hard races, but she seems to have that in. She is tough. She is tough. So if anyone can do it, she do. I know she's got um, support lined up on the way, but shout outs to um, her on Twitter, etc. Well, I think we'll be fed back to her. So yeah. we will report back. I'll try and get some inside goss on it for next week. Best of luck, Anna, for that. So what's coming up, Gary? You've got your London Marathon t-shirt on. Do you wear that night and day now? Just to, <laughs> Yeah, come on. Well, like I said, I'm not training for London. Lisa said, actually, I should film it. I should film my, with my GoPro, film all of London, and then put it out there as a, a virtual. I'm not running with you if you're going to have a GoPro on your head. <laughs> Me and every other white middle-aged man will be oh, there. Oh, really? Is that a thing now? <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm not training for London, but this week Valencia training starts. And talking about Anna kind of get, putting herself in the position to do these events. I'm looking at what's ahead this week. And it's like, I don't know if I'm ready to do that. So I've got five times five minutes. Have a look. I can see you've written it down. Right. Five yeah. by five minutes. Uh, th this would be kind of threshold pace. Um, then a 15 minutes threshold, which 15 minutes threshold run isn't too bad. Then a 40 minute fart leg run. But that for me, and then 90 minutes easy. Um, that's three quality sessions, which I may only do two of those. Uh, yeah. Or what I would do, because also, I mean, that's quality week. You, mm. I would build more into that and be like. That's week four, one. <laughs> yeah. Four by five minutes. <clears throat> just So that's just 20 minutes of work. Yeah. 30 minutes fartlek. 90 minute run easy. That's cool. But I would be just maybe just take get a bit more. Um, and so that otherwise you're going to be knackered. Because yeah. really, you want to be, you want to be building your volume a little bit first back in, don't you? Rather than you're, are you going to try and put a bit of speed in, and your body's going to go whoa, whoa, whoa? Yeah. So we'll see. Well, we'll see. You know, I'll go with that. Um, maybe yeah, we'll do the four fives instead of the five fives. The fifteen minutes. You want to finish. You want to finish the first three, two, three, four weeks of a program, not KO, don't you? You want to be feeling I could do more yeah. rather than exactly, uh, yeah. Then I that was you know five by five minutes be be make four by five minutes really good thinking yeah I def I got another one in the bag then uh, <laughs> you just fall apart won't you but what I what do what you want is... Gary just get to the London Marathon and be knackered that's fine my problem is though I will do those sessions in theory are doable if I had appropriate recovery in between and I'm guilty of running more than I should especially with Rex so <clears throat> but uh, yeah that's that's the that's the level. I might only do two and then 90 minutes on the weekend. Um, but uh, that's it. Week one, Valencia training and yourself then back to base. I do it well. I'm on my holidays at the moment. So I just do, I always, I never try and do anything massive on holiday because I think you've got to be with the fam, haven't you? And it can't be, uh, I don't want to be tired. Yeah. And I want to let my, I've got to, I think you've got to just forget about it for a little while. So I just go now, I do a bit of jogging just to have a bit of quiet time, really. Yet. Turn away from the darlings. <laughs> Don't think we've got to travel back to France, dear Lord, um, in the next few days. And then next week, yeah, back to base. Decide my racing schedule for the second half of the year. I'm more, I'm more, I know I'm not very good at them, but I'm actually more inspired to do more mountain, hilly, terrible stuff just because it's kind of what, like, kind of what motivates me is yeah. like, I'm so bad at this. Can I get better? <laughs> Surely I can only get better at these races. Um, so yeah, I'll decide next week, decide what I'm going to do and um, survive the next last two weeks of the summer holidays. Gone by fast, hasn't it? Summer holidays. Hasn't it actually? I mean, I know I moaned about it quite a few weeks, but it has gone by, gone by fast. <laughs> Right, we're going to do, um, you've been on iTunes looking at what people say about us. Yeah, if you leave a five-star review, you've got a chance that you'll get a shout-out. <laughs> a new has, second to the show. <laughs> has anyone, as my mum said to me wonderfully just a minute ago, who listens to this, Edwina? Who listens well, to this? Loads of people. Honestly, Eddie, I think... Well, I clearly got... my mum doesn't. That's what we find <laughs> yeah. that one up. I got an email from, oh, it's one of the people that we, uh, Budsprout, sorry. I think it was like last week, it was nearly 2,000 downloads across all of the pod, not just like one show. So there's a lot of people out there. But yeah, Peep Hall Skeleton 
left a, a review on iTunes. Great listening, a really relaxed and very informative podcast. The presenters just don't take themselves. Oh, I've got to make this too seriously and share their, oh, I mentioned me, and share their highs and lows. KJ the Runner also left a review. Excellent podcast, really good presenters and interesting guests and also introduced me to Chia Charge Bars, which are delicious. Well, that's fantastic. Chia Charge Bars are delicious. <laughs> the rest, I'm not so sure. I could be to bear. I've not got any at the moment, actually. Me neither. Oh, my God. It's good. <laughs> but yeah, if you leave a five-star review, I will occasionally check out iTunes and... Um, if you Rubbish, looking... you're on it every morning. Has anyone said anything? <laughs> you know what? I never liked that. I, I think I was a bit resistant to reading out these um, e listeners' emails and stuff like that. But it's wonderful that uh, kind of people enjoying the show and leave a review. It's brilliant. We're going to have a competition. We haven't had one for a few weeks. Um, and we, uh, you are in with the chance to win a Cheer Charge kit bag bundle, a little drawstring bag, a Run to the Hills podcast bandana. Oh, my gosh. Flying off the shelves. Some Cheer Charge bags. And it's super simple. All you need to do is follow us on Instagram, Run to the Hills with Cheer Charge, and send us a holiday running snap, either via Instagram or I will pop something on Facebook with me, running on holiday we thought as gary and i were frequent holidays at the moment there must be tons of you out running uh on your holiday so share share us your photos and we're going to choose two two of our faves gary yeah. will choose one i will choose one on tuesday the 24th of august and you could win a bag full of cheer charge goodies that's a good prize that one isn't it it's a good prize and we get to see everyone's pictures we love those we love it right good luck with your valencia training don't overdo it Bill back in steady. Let's see. You'll be on, <laughs> be on Strava now, wouldn't it? I've kind of been dossing Eight, for five, weeks. Five minutes. Decided to really go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not going to do that. If I can enlist some help, then that will make things easier. Have you got your running pal? Who's your fast running pal, Justin? See well, you back um, Bob Graham round Robbo wants to do a bit of speed training. Um, again, he wants to do late 100 <clears throat> next year. And so I think uh, he wants to get some speed in his legs. So I'm going to drag him around with me for a few few sessions. And yeah, I'll probably tap up Justin again. So fingers crossed we'll be all right. Can't wait to hear all about it. That was episode 50. 50 of Run to the Hills. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And let's run to the hills. Ooh.